I want you to try to imagine a time many decades into the future where virtual worlds have become virtually indistinguishable from reality. And within these worlds exists modern gladiatorial style arenas where the brave and the foolhardy alike battle it out for both fame and fortune. This is the concept behind the action-packed FPS called The Finals. And with Season 1 now wrapped up, we take a retrospective look on how this great game did such a good job, initially at least, inserting itself into a market that was already dominated by the likes of Call of Duty, Apex Legends and Battlefield. But beyond that, we also take a look at some of the lessons learned from Season 1, as by the end of the season, the game lost about 90% of its launch player base. We deep dive the root causes of this with the view that going forward into Season 2, Embark have taken the necessary steps to ensure this great game reaches its full potential. It is worth noting that I only played the Steam version of the game, but I have clocked in well over 200 hours at this point. And with all that said, let's just dive straight into it. Where left or right? Uh, don't want you go to go left. I <laughs> <They> go right. Who <laughs> 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 <They> went right? <laughs> Scotty went right. <laughs> If I was to describe to you in one short sentence what the finals is like, I might say something along the lines of, it's an attractive, aromatic blend of other FPS games that you know and love, particularly Apex Legends, Battlefield and Call of Duty. But I wouldn't want you to get mistaken into thinking this is just a carbon copy of those other games. Because while yes, the similarities to other FPS titles are there, it brings so many new and interesting things to the table that the finals is its own beast entirely. It's no secret that free-to-play live service games require lots of people deciding that this is their main game. This is the game they're going to dedicate hundreds, if not thousands of hours to. They must decide to participate in seasonal events, to complete battle passes and to buy skins. And without this, the game simply dies. Rest in peace, the cycle frontier. Gone, but not forgotten. Now, at the start of the video, I posed a question. In a market dominated by Apex Legends, Battlefield and Call of Duty, how does a newcomer like the finals enter that market, but then conceivably contend with the big dogs? How does it draw players from these well-established IPs and pull them over to their game? Well, I do have a theory as to how, and it's all to do with psychology. So I've got a background in sales, and in sales there's a technique called building rapport. In basic terms, you take somebody who is qualified to buy your product, and you use certain techniques to get them to like you. You do this because, well, simply people buy from people they like. Well, obviously, the finals isn't a salesperson, it's a product. So how does this product get you to, at least in the short term, like it? I believe it achieves this by using a sense of the familiar. So like I mentioned, I believe the finals is a blend of other FPS titles. It has similar gunplay to COD, it has movement that's reminiscent of Apex Legends, and it has destructible environments akin to Battlefield. So what happens is you see the game is free to play, so there's no financial barrier to entry. So you then decide to step away from your comfort zone and give it a try. And what you find is you feel an immediate sense of the familiar. And it doesn't matter which of these games you've played previously, something about the finals will still feel familiar to you if you've played any of these games. The familiar is safe. The familiar is comfortable. Safety and comfort are buying emotions. Now the game is free to play, so you're not buying the game, but they subconsciously sold you on the idea of it. It's the same as what you know, but it's also something new and different. New is a novelty, and novelty is a dopamine hook. They have blended the familiar and the novel in an attractive Unreal Engine 5 package, and they've gave it to you for free. Absolutely genius. The question or not for me is whether they did this intentionally or whether it was just some beautiful coincidence based purely on their creative inspirations. So they've gained your curiosity and then they got your attention. But have they been able to maintain that attention through time? Well, gentlemen, you have my curiosity. 
but now you have my attention. Well, according to SteamDB, the unfortunate answer is no, they haven't, at least not for the majority of you. If we look at the figures since the game launched in December, there was a peak of around 240,000 players with an initial drop-off, which was pretty steep. But in January alone, they lost over 125,000 players and a further 67,000 in February. But why? Why have so many left so quickly? And I can already hear you shouting at your screen, but oh, all games go through this decline. And yes, I understand this, but the drop-off here has been quite severe. Most games do have a release peak followed by a decline, which then settles out and balances into the core player base. But if we look at a direct competitor, Apex Legends, for example, they've retained quite a large player base since launch. And look, I want to make this clear. I'm not saying the finals is dead. I'm not even really trying to say the finals is dying, but it does get to a point with free-to-play live service games where you need a critical mass of players to be playing each and every day just to keep the lights on and just to keep the wages of your staff paid. If people are not playing, they're not buying skins. And if they're not buying skins, you don't have a business. Only Embark know for sure if their game is dying because they are the ones that understand their profit and loss margins. Perhaps for Embark, only 10,000 players a day is enough to make the finals profitable. Perhaps not. I'm really only here to ask, why are people leaving? The game is objectively fun and entertaining with a lot of polish and interesting concepts. So why did everyone go? Well, as much as I'm banging on about it, I don't have the silver bullet answer to this, but I do have some ideas as to the contributing factors, and I don't think it's one single thing. I don't think there's one single factor you can point to, but rather several things that when combined have started chipping away at the player's motivation and overall just wearing the player base down. Death by a thousand cuts, if you will, or more specifically, death by three main cuts, at least according to the Reddit community. Some weeks ago, I reached out to Reddit to ask them why they felt the player base had dropped off so much. And to my surprise, a lot of people wanted to wade in and have their say. Some of the main points that kept popping up were balance issues, lack of content and cheaters. And well, I agree. So I am going to deep dive each of these three points, but first I'm going to touch on the cheater problem since there's not really that much to talk about. We all know cheaters are the fucking pond life of the gaming community. They are nothing more than parasitic entities that subsist on the misery of others and they are the scourge of online gamers and gaming companies the world over and nobody is surprised they have infected this game as well. Unfortunately for the finals, the cheater issue was at its worst right at the start when most of the player base was interested to play but not yet committed. And I certainly feel that those that were sitting at this border between interest and commitment were the most affected and many people left. I will say anecdotally, as of right now, there does seem to be far less cheaters than there was, but the damage was already done. Either way, it's still an ongoing battle. And while I do think it's an impossible task to completely fix, I do hope Embark can continue to keep cheating at an absolute minimum. All right, so those that stuck around and persevered through the cheating problem now have two other issues to contend with. And those are balance and lack of content. But let's touch on balance first. The approach the developers have taken when it comes to the gameplay is, in their own words, player choice. They have designed the mechanics in such a way as to give the player systems and tools so they can decide what to do with them. And it's this design mantra that the whole game is approached with. And that's everything from the class system with a choice of three classes, light, medium and heavy, to the way the levels themselves are designed. In an open-ended manner with the destruction model that literally lets you smash your way around the maps and create openings and doors that only exist because you chose them to. There's also a choice when it comes to building your classes with different weapons and utilities to pick and choose from. If you want to play as a ninja from the shadows, you can. If you want to play as a walking hard attack that likes to turtle down and hurl explosives at everything that moves, it's an option. You can snipe from a distance, snipe from point blank, smash with sledgehammers, cook with flamethrowers, spy on people through walls, or be the wholesome healer that works to keep your team in the fight. The point is, the choice is yours. Well, kind of. Because you see, while technically, yes, you do have these choices, certain choices are heavily encouraged over others. That is if you care about winning. If you care about winning, you'll probably be avoiding light in ranked play. You'll probably be forced to play medium with an F card, defib and recon, or heavy with dome shield, rocket launcher and C4. The inherent disadvantages you'll face for not choosing these meta builds will see you and your teammates suffering and fighting an uphill battle against those that have. And I'm going to be honest, it can be really draining to constantly have to both play and play against the meta. The one glaring example that springs to my mind is the heavy with C4 and their ability to create the aptly named nukes. 
These things will literally fucking one-shot Zeus himself, and they are so effective at one point playing ranked, they were the cause of 90% of my deaths, and it was truly exhausting. And what makes it worse is there's no counterplay. Nobody was safe, and everybody was both the abuser and the abused, the guilty and the innocent. And I know so many people that I was playing with that just quit outright because of nukes. And I understand this is the balance conundrum, and it's an issue every game must face. It's a convoluted and intricate task and is an unenviable endeavor that all developers must face. If you simply tweak one small value of, say, a weapon or utility, it can lead to large unintended consequences down the line to something else. I do understand and I empathize with the difficulties of balancing games, especially PvP ones. Metas are both born and broken with each patch, and I can imagine it's like spinning plates to keep things in check. But so far, Embark have struggled to keep these plates spinning in balance, and until they can figure out how to bring more of the game's systems and tools into a greater sense of equilibrium, their whole design philosophy of player choice is undermined, underutilized, and underappreciated. The balance issues only serve to add more straws to the already overburdened camel's back which leads me nicely into the final talking point. The final straw, if you will. So, you've survived the cheaters, you've adapted to the balance issues, and you're learning to thrive in the chaos of the metas. There's one more hurdle you must overcome to make this your main game for the foreseeable future, and that is the lack of content. And what lack of content really translates to is lack of purpose. Let me explain. The systems, mechanics, and level design is done in such a way that no two games will ever play out the same. The destruction, verticality, and traversability of each map means the replayability is essentially endless. The objective is the same for everyone, but the approach you take to achieve it is unique to you and your teammates alone. In games like CSGO or Valorant, the maps are carefully designed in such a way with lanes, channels and rotations that players can learn and then use this knowledge to gain an advantage. There's usually not much vertical space to play around with and if you run into a wall it's an unmovable object. The finals with its destruction model and verticality on top of the plethora of tools it gives you to traverse the terrain, this essentially throws the concept of static maps out the window. In other titles you're working around unmovable objects, in the finals you're adapting to unstoppable forces and it not only lets you but it downright mandates that you burn, blow and blaze your own trail through the maps. It is fun, it's dynamic, it's varied and the physics model makes it super immersive. They say variety is the spice of life. Well, variety is a mechanic inherent to the game's design. So does this make the game spicy? Well, it does mean one thing for the game at least. It means there's more content from less content. It means Embark can increase the mileage on the maps they create, but this does have its limits and the game needs more for us to do. You see, there's currently only four maps and there's not much to choose from either when it comes to game modes. There's really only two, with some light variations to one of them depending if you play casual or sweaty. It doesn't take long for you to reach max player level, around 40 hours. It doesn't take that long to complete the battle pass. It doesn't take long at all to unlock every item in the game, and more importantly, it doesn't take long to start feeling the gentle pull of boredom, followed by the knockout punch of burnout. I think what it all boils down to at the end of the day is, like I said, lack of purpose. The lack of reason to keep playing. The main game mode is fun, but not fun enough for most people to grind out for hundreds or thousands of hours. So far over the last few months, they've released a little bit of content, but this is mostly made up of skins and a couple of timed themed events, which have been pretty fun with cosmetics to unlock for playing in them, but these are just minor variations to the standard game mode. And let's not discount one other fact, there's a lot of competition out there to deal with. Last year was an absolute banger of a year for game releases, and this year is already shaping up to be another unreal year for the industry. Free to play live service games are fighting for your attention and your time from all these other games that are releasing every single day. And in order to maintain that attention, I personally feel they need to bring more to the table. I think the finals is a great game. It has so much untapped potential. I can see it up in lights on the esports stage one day. I support the game and I support the developers. I've bought the battle pass and plenty of skins for that very reason. Embark have created something very special with the core of what they have. They just need to balance things out, massively elaborate on what the game has to offer, and slap the cheeky cheaters on the arse and send them on their way, and the game will be a hit. The finals isn't dead. I don't even really believe the finals is dying. But I'm predicting one thing. If season 2 is not a hit, Embark are going to be in serious trouble.
that's gonna be it for me for now guys if you made it this far i fucking love you thank you for watching let me know if you agree disagree or have anything else you want to add to the discussion i read each and every comment and i strive to reply to most so let's get a discussion going downstairs but if i don't see you in the comments i'll see you in the next one